Hello, and welcome to our virtual reading group extra with Sarah Squire. I'm Christy Horpidal, and today we are taking the briefest of looks at the life and death of King Richard II. It's the first play in William Shakespeare's Henry Tetralogy, and based on the life of King Richard II. The play covers the last two years of Richard's life and his death. Richard is frivolous and arrogant. Henry Bolingbroke, by the end of the play, Henry IV, is proud and ambitious. It's a play about the problems of monarchy, but also what it means to be a divine ruler and a loyal subject. One of my first questions about the play was, who are the traitors? So I'll start with that one, Sarah. I mean, we could do an hour on, as everyone who has been in the virtual reading group with me has discovered, my, my answer to everything is, well, how, you know, we could do a whole hour on that question. Uh, we could do a whole hour on that question. Um, there are, Questions of literal uh, traitor, uh, traitorous activity um, during the play, the uh, assassination of the Duke of Gloucester, which seems to have been uh, Richard's inspiration, but executed, pun intended, by uh, Malbury, um, certainly is a traitorous act. Um, a lot of people within the play would argue that um, many of Richard's actions were traitorous against the country of England, becomes an interesting question in later English history whether a king can be a traitor or not. Um, that's how Charles I ends up losing his head. Um, and uh, then there's the, the very interesting question of Bolingbroke, um, who either takes the crown from Richard, is given the crown by Richard, or somehow uh, ends up with the crown after a very sort of complicated football match over the crown. Um, he is seen by some as a traitor. He is seen by others as a, a uh, rightful, divinely instituted monarch. And you know, when we get to the next play, we get to hear a lot about what Henry IV thinks about his own kingship. So that reminds me of a question we talked about a little bit in the reading group, which was, this question of, is Richard deposed? Uh, does he abdicate or is he actually usurped by Bolingbroke? Where do you stand on that? Well, again, I think it I think it depends on who you are in the play as to what's happening. For me, when I read it, um, I think, as I said the other day, for me, it feels like Richard spends the whole play trying to get desperately to get rid of this crown. He's saddled with it, it's uncomfortable. He's, he believes absolutely that he is the divinely instituted monarch, but he seems super uncomfortable in that role um, and, and seems to feel as if that, that the way that the most important thing he can do as a king is die. Talks about it constantly and is constantly sort of trying to hand Bolingbroke the crown. At one point, he sort of holds it out to him and says, you know, come take it. Bolingbroke doesn't take it. And he's like, come on, cousin take the crown. Um, and it, it gets very weird. And I just have this sense that he's desperately trying to abdicate, but there's no one to whom he can abdicate. And then Bolingbroke comes in and decides to, to yoink it. Um, I'm not <laughs> sure how much of an answer that is, but. Yeah, yeah. Bolingbroke in some sense seems surprised that it went that far, um, that he was asking for his lands back and he ends up with the crown. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not super inclined to to trust a whole lot of what Bolingbroke has to sa say about his intentions. Um, I think he is a very wily guy um, in, in a lot of ways that that we didn't really get a chance to unpack during the reading group. But I, I'm always, I'm heavy side eye for me to, to just about anything when Bolingbroke is like, moi, the crown? No, surely not. I'm a, I find that very, very suspicious. Okay. So um, when Richard says the crown is hollow, so this is in Act 3, Scene 2, the coast of Wales. You're, you're saying earlier he almost seems like he's trying to get rid of it even before yeah. he has to get rid of it. Um, so what do you think Richard means when he calls it hollow? So this is from probably one of the two most famous speeches in the play, the other most famous speech, speech being John of Gaunt's about this sceptered isle, this precious stone set in the Silver Sea, which is some of Shakespeare's most stunning poetry about, about his beloved England. 
And this uh, speech by Richard is, is full of death and full of suffering. This is the one where he calls everyone around and says, come and let us sit on the ground and tell sad stories of the deaths of kings. Um, and is imagining his own death and the death, death of all these things, kings. And he says, you know, within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court, right? And it's so, it's as if not only is the idea of kingship hollowed out for Richard, empty almost, just a gilded outside with, with no, no real content within, which is a pretty good way to think about Richard's character as a whole as well. But not only is the idea of kingship beautiful on the outside, but hollow on the inside like a crown, there's, there's just this sense that um, it's, it's not, it, it's empty, but it's, it's sort of a, a, a super emptiness, an extra emptiness like the emptiness of the grave, like the emptiness of death, right? And that to, to put that crown on your head is to somehow wear death or embody death in a weird way for Richard. Um, and I think I think he's so um, understandably given you know English history and the way that that kings are, as he points out, the way that kings are frequently ushered off the stage. Um, understandably, he's he's death obsessed and constantly thinking about what his own end will be. But but you know I don't think he even has this moment where he thinks of, or at least during this play, where he really thinks of a glory of kingship or of like martial honor or any of that stuff. It's just all so full of, as he says, graves and epitaphs, right? Yeah. So you mentioned the poetry of the play. Um, I, I have read that this is one of his most poetic plays, perhaps the most poetic play. So what do you think in particular that we can learn about the poetry in this play as opposed to some of his other plays or as opposed to other poetic works? Well, I, I think that one of the things that's that's interesting um, about uh, Shakespeare as a writer is that, you know, we think of him as a great poet, which of course he is, um, but he doesn't just deploy that magnificent verse willy-nilly, right? He deploys it with a real purpose. And when he has a character like Richard, who is all about this sort of like deep, constant, obsessive introspection, that's a really good place to unleash a lot of poetry, right? That, that, that sort of um, rumination over ideas of kingship, over the fear of death and the longing for death at the same time. And that's really, that's kind of a space where some really good poetry lives. He doesn't unleash that all of the time. Right, he has a different poetic and dramatic voices that he uses for different characters. Right, so when we get to uh, the first and second parts of Henry the Fourth next week in the reading group, it's a very, very different poetic voice. There's a lot of prose um, in the Henry Fourth, and there is none in Richard the Second. Right, and so I think one of the things that we can learn about the verse is how um, canny, how clever, how intentional. Shakespeare is about when he's using the varying different voices that he has as a writer. He's not just, you know, throwing spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks. He's, he's doing this on purpose. I thought I also noticed even a difference in Richard when he's deposing himself or being usurped, um, when he's being a king and when he's trying to stop being a king. And that, that was such a beautiful, interesting moment, how even the words that he uses have to change when he's not a king anymore. That's a really nice observation. I think one of the preoccupations of the Henriad of this first tetralogy um, is this uh, distance between the public face of kingship and the private world of the king as a human being. Um, and so we do see Richard kind of switching his vocabulary and, and we'd say now code switching, right? Depending on, on the contexts uh, in which we see him. He's often preoccupied with the same stuff, but he talks about it in different ways. And actually there's a really good example just in this speech that we're talking about. Um, 
he says here, um, oh no, I've lost, here it is. Uh, um, come sit upon the ground uh, and tell sad stories of the deaths of kings, how some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. Right, so he's talking about telling stories of the deaths of kings. And then later on in the play, in act five, the very last act of the play, he says to his queen, when I'm dead, ere thou bid me good night, to quiet their griefs, tell thou the lamentable tale of me and send the hearers weeping to their beds. For why the senseless brands will sympathize the heavy accent of thy moving tongue and in compassion weep the fire out and some will mourn in ashes, some coal black for the deposing of a rightful king, right? And it's a, it's a little less formal. It's a little more of an intimate register. It's less sort of ringing grand verse in that second exploration of exactly the same subject, right? So you can see it happen right on the page. Thanks for sharing that. Are there other quotes or speeches you want to make sure we get to talk about? I mean, there are so many. I think I, I want to talk for just a second about the the John, the famous John of Gaunt speech, in part because it is famous. It's, it, this is one of, even if people have never read Shakespeare, odds are there are a couple of speeches that they're at least kind of have in their toolbox, like Shylock, you know, hath not a Jew eye, hath not a Jew hands. And uh, Mark Antony, friends, Romans, and countrymen, lend me your ears. And, and this is one of those speeches, right? I love that you think that. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. <laughs> so John of Gaunt, who is uh, getting ready to die, is kind of the, the um, romanticized version of this older order that Richard has destroyed through his plot, profligacy and his irresponsibility in general, being a jerk. Um, and Gaunt gives this wonderful speech about how much he loves England. And I want to, I want to, do we have enough time for me to read it? Yeah, please. Probably just. Um, he says of England, and listen to how, how often the word this shows up in this speech. That's what I want you to listen to. The switch from the word this to the word that. This is serious English department territory, sorry. This royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea, which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands, this blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, this nurse, this teeming womb of royal kings, on and on and on. And then at the end of the speech, that England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself, right? And what he's saying here is we had all this, this wonder, this magic, this protection, and you turned it into that. That is gone. You lost it. And it's vicious and it's gorgeous and it's really well done. I mean, there's a reason that that speech is as famous as it is. It's just masterful. Um, I'll also include links to each of the speeches when we post this. So people can go and read the glory for themselves. Um, In case, have, case other people are super excited by definite pronouns, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's got to be a few. There's a few yes. of them out there. And I feel like they're going to find this video. So I want it to be there for them. Um, <laughs> I've got one more longish question and then a short question at the end. So okay. um, the, this one is based on a comment in the, the virtual reading group that I didn't know anything about, but I, mm -hmm. I sense that you do. And that there is a well-known, but perhaps false story about Elizabeth I in relation to this play. So I was wondering if you could tell us uh, what that sort of infamous story is and what your thoughts on it are. Well, I'm actually going to point people to uh, the Reading Room blog, which is about to have a post on exactly this question. Um, but I will say that when uh, the Earl of Essex wanted to rebel against Queen Elizabeth I, uh, he paid to have a production of Richard II uh, mounted at the Globe um, and uh, lost his head as a result of it. Um, 
Elizabeth reportedly um, said about that production, know you not that I am Richard II, meaning that one of the reasons that Essex was in so much trouble for it was because the ineffectual, irresponsible, profligate Richard II was meant to be a direct attack on, on Elizabeth when used in this context. But I will, I will point people to the blog for a, a longer explanation. Plays are so dangerous, right? Aren't they? <laughs> they okay. certainly are. So my last question is, who do you think Richard's better? Ben Wishaw in The Hollow Crown or David Tennant in The Royal Shakespeare Company? This is difficult because I am an unrepentant David Tennant fangirl. Uh, I just adore him. I think he's fascinating. His wig in the RSC production <laughs> is shockingly awful. I am sure that it read much better on stage than it does in video, but it's really super not good. Um, and Ben Wishaw's hair is a lot better. Um, I think they both uh, do extremely interesting and very different portrayals. Um, I think Wishaw's uh, Richard II is much more otherworldly, um, ethereal. He seems barely connected to the earth at all. Um, and Tennant's portrayal is is a much uh, a much more grounded portrayal and much more uh, visceral performance. So it's really interesting to to see the two of them. Well, thank you for that. Um, for those of you who don't know, I should have started with Sarah Squire as a senior fellow at Liberty Fund, as well as a Shakespeare scholar. And this conversation is inspired by our virtual reading group hosted by Liberty Fund on Richard II, Henry IV, Part One and Two, and Henry V. So thank you for watching and thanks, Sarah, for answering these questions today. Thanks so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Christine.